Good morning, everybody. Hopefully we're online um, and, and a very well welcome to this TDI session on parking data. Guess everybody can hear me, um, so that's all good. Um, for those of you who do not know me, I'm head of the Smarter Traffic Management team at the Department of Transport, and I'm also a member of a TDI board. Some of you may also recall that I led the North Highland consultants discovery into local transport data, which reported in 2019. Amongst the discoveries, many findings and recommendations, the consultants identified parking and traffic regulation orders as two of the highest valued data of local authority data sets. So you'll be hearing throughout this session how the department has worked really closely with a lot of the sector, including the British Park Association, to help realise this value. I think the key point I would like to make is that this data value is at the heart of the department's future of transport strategy. Parking is seen as a key component as we move towards parking as a service. These data services offer, many, offer up many new opportunities, I believe, not least in developing curbside management policies and strategies. Before I introduce the first speaker, I would like to point out that my colleague, Julian O'Kelly from the British Parking Association will be running the Q&A session, will be running up the Q&A throughout these sessions. So for you, the audience, I'd be grateful if you can please post your questions in the Q&A function on, of the stream. Upvote any questions that, they, that you agree with or want answered. And be assured that any questions that we miss, because we may not have time to cover all of these, will be recorded and answered eventually, certainly within the next week or so. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce the first speaker, Keith Williams. Keith is a board member of the APDS, the Alliance for Parking Data Standards, which is central to today's discussions. And he works on developing the parking data standard. He has worked on developing this parking data standards. Day job, he's the technical director of Parking Matters, and he helps local authorities and others to develop and implement technology strategies for parking and curbside management. Keith will now introduce the Alliance for Parking Data Standards. Thank you, Graham, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, and uh, my apologies for giving Graham a uh, sentence about what I do, which is almost impossible to, uh, to actually speak. I should try it myself next time. Um, so can we have the first slide, Tom? I'd like to introduce you, uh, Greg. Uh, he doesn't look anything like me, I'd just like to point out, and um, he and I have absolutely nothing in common. Greg is our uh, token parking manager and uh, is uh, prone to speaking the obvious, and the obvious is that smarter parking is all about data. And because it's all about data, it's also all about standards. Go to the next slide, please, Tom. And just to introduce the uh, the Alliance for Parking Data Standards and why, wh who we are and what we are. Um, just want to show you this, and I apologise if people have seen this slide before because some some of the audience may have done. Um, but it's a key um, slide behind the reason for the Alliance for Parking Data Standards. Some three years ago now, um, a number of organisations were were looking at how data and and parking was was developing. And a long time ago, the uh, situation with parking was that you drove into a car park or stopped at the side of the road, you took a ticket, and, and that was the only relationship you had with the uh, parking operator, whether it was a local authority or, or private. And over the past, well, 10 years now or more, that has changed quite radically. And we're now in a situation where the, uh, the operators are uh, along the bottom here in the uh, car parks and on street parking and so, and so on. And the consumers are at the top and there are any number of different players in between. And uh, one of my colleagues once said, uh, if you can't see yourself on here, then you're not in the parking industry. So uh, it is an American slide this, so there are some people like uh, Spot Hero who aren't in the UK, but uh, it is very relevant to the, to the situation we have today. And, was one of the drivers behind the uh, the Alliance for Parking Data Standards. Go to the next slide, please. So, who are we? Um, well, the founders of the uh, um, Alliance for Parking Data Standards are three 
parking associations. So we're in industry standard. And that's the, the British Parking Association, the European Parking Association and IPMI, which is the uh, American equivalent almost, but much larger than the, the BPA. And we got together about three years ago to to look at how standards could be used within parking. And we started off by looking at existing parking standards, because as you'll see later, there are other standards um, that uh, have a have some kind of claim on on the parking domain. But we realized fairly quickly that from an industry point of view, from the from the point of view of the people actually involved in parking, none of the existing standards really did the job. And so we got together and formed the Alliance for Parking Data Standards. Um, and as you can see, our uh, the Department for Transport and, and Graham's team have been very generous in funding the initial uh, phase of, uh, of the uh, APDS development. You just click on the next, thank you. And we have a number of sponsors from the industry, um, both in the US and in Europe and and the UK. I know we're not part of Europe anymore. Um, almost. So uh, it is very much what the industry needs and what stakeholders who are involved in the, se the sector need. And click again, please. And we have developed the standards using a model where we have working groups of people self-selected in many cases, but uh, also people we have sought. Um, who come from all of the stakeholders within the parking sector. So um, equipment manufacturers, companies that you would have seen on, the, on our uh, spaghetti diagram earlier on, um, operators and other public sector organisations, local authorities and so on. And they have all come together to, uh, to develop what is now quite an extensive standard and I'll tell you a little bit about it in a moment. And we already have worldwide over 300 organizations who have downloaded our documentation and are using it in various ways already to, uh, to develop their work. Next slide, please. So what is Alliance for Parking Data Standards? Um, and what are our, our uh, we don't call them standards, we have to call them specifications, but I'll explain why in a second. Um, and one of my colleagues uh, gave a very elegant 30 minute um, uh, presentation a couple of days ago on this one slide. So it is going to be a bit of a, uh, a canter through, uh, through what we have. Um, really APDS is about how do you communicate data from one system to another. It's not really designed to determine what those systems should hold, how uh, consumers actually relate to parking. All of that is outside of what we do. We are really about making sure that systems are interoperable. And that's quite important going back to our spaghetti diagram that someone who makes a reservation in a car park, how does that information get into the car park system how is it how is the payment then communicated and so on and over the last three years we have developed uh, specifications that cover the six different areas that uh, are on this slide and it's going to say there aren't six um, firstly there was the idea of place so where is where is a place to park on street or off street um, what's its uh, characteristics? So is it a multi-storey car park? Is it a uh, spaces at the side of the road? Is it disabled bay and so on? Or even is it an exit or an entry to a car park? Because as systems become more, more automated, the positioning of, of uh, features is, is becoming more and more important. And that also is linked into to occupancy, which is uh, far more complicated uh, um, domain than than just putting a number of spaces on a VMS sign. There's also, you know, how has a car park contracted out a certain number of spaces and, uh, or, and so on. And then we look at the the rate or, or tariff and we have a, a way in which the tariff can be um, uh, communicated to uh, 
other systems in a way those other systems we are to understand. So it's not really trying to say this is how a tariff should be structured. It's really trying to take the structures that exist at the moment and, and make them communicable. And those uh, three um, parts were the, the first uh, phase of, uh, of APDS, which was uh, developed about uh, 18 months ago. And then towards the end of last year, we released the second phase, which was more about transactions in parking. So the first bit is, is about parking rights. And this is a concept whereby um, if you think about a, uh, a plate at the side of the road that says parking for 30 minutes, um, pay at a meter, that is giving a what's called a right specification. That's saying this is what the parking right is in this particular place. And then someone who buys a ticket is actually taking a, um, a right and assigning it to themselves. And the actual act of parking is a session. So when they arrived, when they left and so on. And the uh, observation part is that obviously not everybody pays for parking, surprise, and uh, when they should do. And so the observation is the ability to compare what is actually on the street with what should be there. So what, should, what sessions should be in place in a certain place at a certain time and then off to the side which is the bit that's not six is enforcement and how those observations get uh, communicated into an enforcement system Can I have the next slide please tom so uh, our uh, token user today says well that's all very nice fine and nice but uh, um, kayla says how will that help me park my car next slide please tom and there are a number of potential use cases of how this might work. This is one use case, which I'm not going to go into because uh, it's the National Parking Platform, which is the subject of a presentation later. But it's just linking in the APDS concept of all this stuff I've just been talking about in terms of a, a, of a specification into the, the, the use cases and how they are actually being used. Next slide, please. What I want to do is just illustrate one way in which it might be used. So I want to introduce ETA to you. Um, next, please. And uh, Etta is uh, um, a person who works for a small company that uh, sells reflecting, reflective cycling products. Next, please. And the company has got a great idea for a new product and they wanted, this is um, pre or post COVID, of course, um, let's not get into that. Um, they wanted to, uh, to check out their uh, prototypes with, uh, the, with the, their colleagues in the industry and see how well it's received. Next, please. And Etta uh, basically volunteers to uh, to drive the van. She's quite ambitious, Etta, and uh, nothing wrong with that. Um, and she's been told that the convention centre they're going to is in the middle of town. There's no way she's going to get anywhere close to it. And uh, you know, good luck with driving that van. Next, please. So Etta is quite enterprising, and she went onto the uh, the internet and she found a new fictional uh, parking app called Curbmate. And what Curbmate does is it um, aggregates all of the parking spaces um, in Europe using APDS um, um, interfaces. And Eta finds out that actually there is the ability to drive in right up to the convention center. She has to pay a certain amount of money for it, but uh, she can get an unloading permit. So a bit of curbside management rather than parking. And then it's an electric van. She's uh, not going to get there and back on one charge. So she actually finds a car park not very far away that she can charge the van in. Next, please. So when she gets to the convention center, there's an AMPR controlled bollard, which is ready for, uh, for Etta's uh, license plate and lowers the bollards for her and allows her in. And the Curbmate app is also a journey planner and it reminds her that she can only drive at 15 miles an hour in the area. Next, please. Next, please. Thank you. So Etta pulls one over on her colleagues and who thought she was uh, going to have a very difficult time with it. And everything goes very smoothly and uh, she's promoted as a result. So that is just one use case um, that uh, you could see maybe has some effect on uh, on the way people actually experience parking and and how it might affect 
the way you deliver parking in the future. Next, please. Thank you. So that's APDS in a nutshell, but just wanted to point out that there are a lot of standards around. And um, so those standards cover a lot of different aspects of ITS that and data that uh, you might be experiencing at the moment. And whilst parking management is the largest blob there because we're talking about parking, all the other blobs have, uh, have their uh, um, density as well. And you can see that all those standards that are on there have something to say about parking and they're all at different stages. So on the right hand side, the three uh, um, TPEG, UTMC and NetEx have been around for quite a long time. Um, one is an ISO standard, the other two are European standards and they each have something to say about parking from their own perspectives. Um, and then the other four, including APDS, are actually emerging standards. So APDS is at the moment becoming an ISO standard and there are some other standards which are at various uh, points in their development and TROD is one of the ones that will be mentioned later on. Next please. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to, um, the unkind person might say colonize, but actually what we're trying to do is we're trying to coordinate standards so that the industry's definition of parking and the concepts within parking actually are familiar to the other standards. So when you are using, it doesn't matter which standard you're using, at some point you might be able to use APDS or a similar uh, communication technology to communicate to between parking and other systems. So for example, at the moment, we are involved in a, a conversation with Datex to uh, take um, its parking definition called part six and replace it with something that's far more like APDS. Um, John will talk later about TROD. And there are um, a couple of uh, standards. One is led by the in, by the automotive industry around automated valet parking. So you leave your car park at the entrance to a car park and it drives in and parks itself. Um, and even further in the future, there is a, another ISO standard developing, which is about all sorts of curbside automation and, uh, and also driving on the curb as well. So little robots driving around the curb and the standards that are required for that. So AP, that's a very quick introduction to, to APDS and um, I'm sure if you're interested, there are uh, documents that you can read and there are other uh, webinars that are going on all the time about APDS, so uh, please contact us. So thank you and uh, back to you, Graham. Thank, thank you, Keith. Thank you very much indeed. So Keith, that's got a really um, interesting introduction, I think, to the APDS standard and, and very, very interesting, focused on the user perspective. Uh, Tom, this is saying that I'm still live rather than Graham. It's all good. It's all good. Okay. Sorry, Graham. Sorry. Could can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we've got you. All fine. Sorry. So, just to reiterate. I mean, thanks, Kate. That was a really useful introduction to the, the new standard, the APDS, and really helpful to get a user perspective to that to actually make to explain how that will actually, will actually help improve. The service directly to the user himself but of course standard must involve a whole value chain if it's going to be a, a successful and so i'd like to welcome the next speaker Tice altina who is the head of data at part now part now is the company that features brands well known to most people in the parking sector like ringo but also part mobile part line and part now in other countries he will be talking as a member of ap yesterday and cover the evolution of the current data model from a private sector perspective. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Graham. Um, can we have the next slide up, please, Tom? Thank you very much. And the next one. This is just here to introduce myself and uh, also Ringo and Park now. I will also be talking a little bit about the need for data standards from a uh, from a company perspective. But as I'm speaking uh, on behalf of APS today, I would then like to uh, spend, I think, most of the uh, most of the time for this presentation uh, on the evolution of the APS model as we see it. Next slide, please. And the next one. Thank you. 
So just to quickly introduce uh, the company and um, uh, of Park now to you, um, as you are probably all aware, um, mobile payments for parking uh, specifically on the street has been around for quite some time now. In 1997, it was introduced by Cobalt in the UK. And a couple of years later, there was a similar alternative that was launched in the Netherlands. Uh, these two companies then came together in 2012 to form the Park Mobile Group um, with uh, the launch of Ringo included as a brand. And then later that company evolved to become Park Now with uh, BMW first acquiring shares of a 100% and then later uh, Daimler came in uh, with uh, uh, equal share of 50-50. Uh, next slide please. So we now operate in eight countries, seven of which are in Europe and one is the US. Um, and it basically, this slide I put in here to show you that uh, as a company, we have quite some experience in, in the different operations um, uh, or the modes of operations that apply in each of these countries. So uh, as you all know, uh, the UK is predominantly a tender driven market, um, but we also have uh, open market situations like in the Netherlands or in Belgium. And we have a great variety of, of mixed market situations, which predominantly aim at um, uh, multi-vendor situations. Um, so basically in the time that we've been operating in these countries, we've had uh, the, the possibility to gain some experience with uh, how it works in each of these three market situations. Next slide, please. And in the UK, uh, uh, Ringo has a uh, uh, position in many of the parking areas, uh, not all of them. Uh, and in each of these green areas, we operate in varying ways. So I'm not saying you know we, we are in the same uh, uh, operative mode in each of these uh, uh, areas, but we have activities in all of the green areas. Uh, the UK market then obviously is a uh, predominantly buy time transactions driven market where we see in other countries that there's also uh, uh, start stop uh, modes. Um, and as I already said, uh, it's predominantly tender driven where, where we see a bit of a trend of markets opening up also in the UK. Um, our company has been engaged mostly in non barrier parking, uh, but we do see that uh, gated parking is growing at the same time. Next slide, please. So uh, specifically in the UK, we are seeing that uh, there's high dynamics in this market. Uh, we, we are roughly seeing three buckets of trends that collaborate and uh, uh, have an influence on, on each other. First of all, we see technology evolving quite rapidly with the coming about of peer-to-peer -peer platforms, but also the continuous evolution of operating systems throughout. Um, uh, and there's many more examples, of course, of the way uh, those things are communicated through APIs and everything. Uh, it, it really changes uh, the, the, the technology. Uh, in the industry, we are seeing a substitution of hardware in the streets with uh, software in terms of apps and other types of um, information holders that people have in their mobile phone. But we're also seeing the coming about of uh, emission based parking or net zero parking and we see a, a, a change in industry where it comes to gated versus non gated parking. Uh, and at the same time, we are seeing some market developments as well. Uh, multi vendor markets exist, as I said earlier, but at the same time, we're seeing uh, uh, partners coming closer together or even consolidating into one company. So basically these three bucket of trends need to be uh, interpreted and basically we, we need to digest and understand which insights come from it to be able to operationalize on these insights, which would then bring us closer to the four uh, major goals that we have. I think we all, as we are sitting here together virtually, uh, share those goals of making sure that all our cities will become more sustainable, more safe, uh, more cost effective and more smart. Next, next slide, please. And the next one. So that brings us to how do we go about the data standards? And um, as we uh, have been uh, piloting with dashboards like these ones, this is a fake one, by the way, uh, we've been handing these out to a couple of uh, uh, city councils that we've been working with just to show in one overview the locality of parking transactions, tell you a little bit about the revenue and the uh, the volume of the transactions throughout a period of time. But maybe we can also share some information around the fuel types of the cars parking in the streets, 
uh, and maybe also the type of vehicles. Next slide, please. And what councils came back with was a heap of um, uh, feedback that we had to digest and iterate into a new version, which is the one that you see in the top right of this slide. Um, the feedback was a, a broad array of things like layouts and revenues, fuel types, customer behavior and stuff like that. Um, and this is where it really grew into. And this is about as far as we can take it. We can tell you in a little bit more granularity where the parking transactions have taken place. We can tell you all types of things like the trend in the growth of revenues or the trend in the growth of the transactions. Maybe we can drill down a little bit more in the mission types and stuff like that. And maybe we can jump to even outside the area of parking alone by telling you a little bit about, for instance, um, air pollution. The, the three pictures in the, on the bottom of the slide depict the situation of uh, London in 2016. In the middle, there's a little picture on uh, how this looked in, uh, in the first COVID lockdown period and then uh, straight after the lockdown period in the month of August. Next slide, please. But that is just about as far as we can go if we look at parking as a uh, as a silo. So if we want to use the current model of APDS, we see that it describes a parking activity very, very well. As Keith was already saying, first it depicted on uh, the parking rights and then it started to describe in a second phase uh, the parking transaction. And now it holds elements like occupancy and rate and rights and session. Next slide, please. But if you then want to expand the model into being able to cover not only parking as an activity, but also parking as a part of the entire mobility journey of a customer, then that poses a bit of a, a problem because it basically means that you are going to split your, your model into two elements. One is geared at the operator or the, or the council and the other one is geared at the customer. Now, as you can see from the uh, from the high number of gray boxes on the left hand side of the slide, only a couple of them, notably the ones with the green uh, green edges, are the ones that uh, are uh, described in detail in the model as we use it today. Uh, but if we want to move further and be able to describe not only the parking activity, but also the customer interaction, we are going to have to introduce a number of new elements to fit the model and to grow it. And this is basically what I what I would like to do together with you as an audience, because my suggestion would be that through APDS we add at least the, uh, the element of customer to the model to be able to uh, understand better how a customer interacts with a parking transaction. And then maybe next slide, please. When we've done that, we can then uh, try to test that model against other modes of mobility and then notably public transportation, taxis, uh, bicycle hire, EV charging and car sharing. Because if that works and if we get to find out how customers interact with parking first, but then maybe those other modes of mobility later, it would bring us even closer to the way that we can obtain the goals of being more sustainable, more safe, more cost effective and more smart. Next slide, please. So that brings me to indeed the conclusions and the insights. I've been able to tell you a little bit about our company and how it's been, how it's gone uh, uh, through its history and that we've been around for a while. Uh, but more importantly, I think uh, in, in the industry as a whole, we are seeing that it's moving away from the siloed approach of talking merely about either roads or parking or public transportation into talking about mobility as a whole. That's also what we see in the customer side. Um, we also know that we need to shape the mobility to be able to reach the city goals that we have um, and that requires close steering on insights. Now the insights we do have using the model that we have today, at the same time we also see that it needs to evolve. Um, so the insights require a uniform data model and then subsequently the definitions that come from it. Um, and we, this is where we would like to interact uh, with you as you are sitting here today, because we know that a heap of new information needs to be absorbed by the model. APD is here, APDS is here to evolve that model, but we need to interact together with you to uh, basically share the priorities that we have in adding elements to that same model. So that concludes my bit. Um, I'm looking very much forward to talking to you in an interactive manner to make sure that we introduce customer or maybe another element into the model to make sure that we can 
um, basically grow this from parking alone to mobility as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thais. Very interesting. And I think the uh, point about the application of a standard to assist the mobility, uh, mobility journey for a customer is a really important one, um, which leads to me uh, quite neatly, I think, onto the next uh, speaker. The department is really keen to explore that journey. And we have funded Manchester City Council to, uh, to trial and adapt the APDS uh, park standard for their, for their authority. Well, that I shall now, so I'm now pleased to welcome the next speaker, who is Danny Holden from Manchester City Council. Danny has worked in the parking industry for around 15 years and will be sharing with us today the story of Manchester's involvement in a national parking platform funded by the top department and centering on the APDS standard. Danny. Thank you, Graham, and good morning all. Could we have the first slide, please? In February 2019, Manchester City Council submitted a funding for innovation bid to the Department for Transport and working with colleagues at Parking Matters, we were looking at the potential to create a publicly owned parking platform that could process parking data in a uniform fashion that could potentially be the start of the journey towards facilitating the enormous changes that we all expect in the parking industry over the next few years. Next slide, please. Our aim was simple by design, as you can see from the diagram extracted from our bid. We set out in what has become the first phase to upload space availability data from NCP and QPark sites for off-street car parks, along with details of on-street traffic regulation orders for Manchester City Centre to show static data for on-street spaces and restrictions and crucially all in the very specific format APDS that Keith explained to us earlier. Again by design once the data was published to the publicly owned platform no plans were made as to what would happen next. The vision was that at this stage it would be over to the private sector to use this information in any way it liked. Although, as you can see from the diagram, we did have some app providers involved in the project to uh, help us to prove the concept. Next slide, please. So hopefully this is a video. Here we go. So using our project partners, Parkopedia, I searched last night for a car park in Manchester. And as you can see, I found the NCP car park next to the Arndale Centre. So as you can see, this car park has 40, 1,487 spaces, nothing too exciting there. But as I scroll down, you will see that there is an availability section that shows how many spaces are available right now thanks to the parking platform that NCP are uploading live data into and Parkopedia who are publishing the data in real time. Next slide please. Manchester Council were delighted with the results delivered by the project team that was led by Parking Matters and I think it's fair to say from the headline in the DFT press release that they were pleased with the results too. So much so, in fact, that the conversation immediately turned to a phase two of the project. Next slide, please. We want to grow the data providers, as you can see on the left, but crucially, we wanted to introduce a multi-vendor payment function and a central usage register. The idea being that customers can not only find parking through the platform, but pay for it too and the usage register will inform car park operators, including local authorities, that a parking session has been bought and therefore that a vehicle is authorised to park. So in practice, that might mean that a civil enforcement officer's handheld equipment in a pay and display car park knows that a vehicle has paid, or it could be an electronic barrier or roller shutter that reads a number plate and opens because the vehicle is expected. 
it could mean that customers pay via their own preferred vendor and they won't need different vendor accounts when they different when they visit different towns or cities and again the concept is to let to be led by the private sector to allow the industry to use the platform however it wants to based on what consumers want next slide please and so at this stage we move on to my own interpretation of what this may become in my mind this is a real just eat moment when Just Eat launched, the resistance factor was enormous. There were takeaway food shops all over the country that were convinced that their customers liked things the way they were. In many cases, they were literally on first name terms with their customers and were providing bespoke services like a kebab for Dave with no tomatoes. The chances of them needing to share a slice of this with a disruptor platform who would want a share of their profits was zero. But now, the 20 minute phone call they used to have to endure to accept orders over the phone are a thing of the past. Customers can order a meal for the full extended family by literally clicking the reorder button and the industry has changed forever. Ringing a takeaway and asking them to read out the menu to the whole family over the phone just seems crazy now. I can see this happening with the platform. I think over the next five years, it will become commonplace for customers to tell their connected car or smartphone where they're going and expect it to organize the parking for them alongside their directions. It will be based on preferences like nearest versus cheapest or cheapest versus safest. And it will become and it will accommodate bespoke needs like wide spaces for those of us with posh cars or electric charging points for those of us that need it. And it will choose on street or off street based on the destination. So for example, it won't send you to an off street car park if you nip into Greg's for a sandwich and there's a set of pay and display bays nearby. And all of this will be overlaid with availability data. So your car or phone will be deciding where best to park in real time as you travel to your destination. As the private sector takes the lead, we will hopefully see validation deals playing a role too, with cinema chains, for example, providing parking with your movie, again, organised through the platform. Eventually, parking spaces that are not listed on the platform will effectively not exist, just like the takeaways that are not on Just Eat. It's rumoured that despite the huge resistance factor faced by Just Eat, their biggest challenge in the end was the enormous queue of vendors wanting to join their platform when the penny finally dropped. Thank you and back to you, Graham. Many, many thanks, Danny. I've always been very excited, as you know, by the National Parking Platform, but I had never, ever thought of it in terms of just eat. So you've just completely changed my, my, my whole value of the National Parking Platform. And hey, it makes it even more valuable, Danny. So a really great thank you for that. A really important development, I think, from the department's perspective. The, I think the, the opportunities for the parking platform are, are almost endless in terms of the applications and uses for that. And we, the department, are certainly looking at the use cases which we might want to develop in conjunction with Danny and the rest of the team. And on that basis, I'd like to introduce the next speaker, please, which is Nigel Williams. Nigel may be known to most of you, I think, because Nigel is the chair of not only the, of the APDS board, but he's also chair of, of the British Parking Association, and he's the founder and managing director of Parking Matters, a specialist parking consultancy which he works with chiefly. So Nigel, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Graham. Always good to unmute yourself. Uh, can everyone hear me? Right, well, um, following on from Danny, this is going to be um, a bit of a letdown, I think, because that was really good, because it, effectively it, what he's managed to capture there is 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 the, 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 the user's perspective, why it's important. Um, what I'm going to talk to you uh, about is, is, is a, a little bit about the sort of the phase of the platform we're working on at the moment and, and how the different bits and pieces work. But uh, I think what Danny was saying, just eat, is, is the important bit really to remember. So uh, first slide, please. Uh, Keith um, flashed this slide up earlier, um, and there were a couple of things uh, that perhaps he didn't say about it that I will. So the first is down in the left-hand corner, you can see there are three logos uh, now. Um, so Alliance for Parking Data Standards, Industry Standard, but also ISO and Datex. Um, and he, the 
the, the, the reality is that um, uh, the Alliance for Parking Data Sta Standards, so APDS, the technical specifications of that are going to become the global uh, standard for parking data um, over the next few months in the sense of both ISO and Datex have taken the decision uh, to, to, to base the standards for parking data uh, on the APDS standards. Um, here, what we're, what we're looking at here is, is, is the sort of principle of the of national parking platform. So what Danny showed you earlier with the, the different boxes, this is just a, a slightly different view of it. Um, so uh, essentially, perhaps the most important stuff, top right, you've got the customers. They link through uh, the, the service providers, so companies like Ringo and, 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 and their competitors. Um, who who provide services directly to the customers, uh, giving them information on on, on what parking is available, um, on what the prices are, what types of parking, as Danny was saying, you know, do you want a wide space for your car? Do you want to park on street, off street, whatever? Uh, and increasing the the well, the ability to pay uh, through your 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 smartphone or eventually just your your in car system will will, will pay. I mean, it was interesting, uh, Tyson. Um, uh, remark that uh, um, Park now is is owned by uh, two uh, automobile um, manufacturers. Um, so the the customers can get information about where where they're going, what's available in terms of parking. They can book uh, and they can pay for their parking, and all of that's uh, then links through to the other top, the, sorry, the top left, which is the the parking operators, but also the parking equipment, because one of the big problems at the moment is that there is um, there is no standard uh, for the way data is structured uh, in the different systems and how it's communicated between the different systems. So it makes it very difficult uh, at the present time and expensive to um, uh, to be able to 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 give the information to customers and to link through to the the, the different payment systems. And that's what really what the so APDS is 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 the is the um, the standard that, that that allows that interoperability. Um, and the national parking platform is is an, one implementation uh, of uh, APDS that allows these these three um, um, what are they these three actors if you like or three uh, yes to 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 um, to communicate with each other. Next slide, please. So uh, concretely. Uh, in this phase uh, of of the development of the national parking platform, just to, to, we're we're actually looking at three three use cases. Okay, so use case one, payment on arrival, um, is 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 basically what happens uh, if you use Ringo or Park Now or uh, I don't know Appy Way or whatever when you park on street. So it is you know you you um, um, you, you 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 turn up. Um, you you enter in your your parking session details uh, and you, and you pay on your app um, and the operator can check that you know with the it goes through to the enforcement um, uh, software. The difference here is it goes through the parking platform, which allows, uh, as 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 Tees was saying, what happens in 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 other places, basically multi vendor as we call it uh, operations, so that you can um, uh, you, you know if you you don't. If you're, if you're for some reason or other, um, you're, you're, you prefer pay by phone or Appy Way or I can't think of any of the others, um, Just Park uh, to uh, to Ringo. That in in you will be able to use whoever is your preferred uh, um, service provider in any car park eventually, uh, and certainly in the, in the in the, in the number of car parks in this first iteration of the platform, which is a, a proof of concept over which will be be in place over the next. Uh, well, it's it's going to be in place in in, in January and and running for um, for at least uh, six nine months, uh, and then 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 it's going to be a question about how uh, how the platform can then be turned into a um, a self sustaining. Um, entity with governance, etc. There's discussions going on at the moment about that. The second um, uh, um, use case is 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 one which is perhaps a nirvana in many cases. So you just basically drive your car in. Uh, the AMPR uh, picks up the uh, the car registration, and the parking platform then uh, communicates with the service providers, and the service providers say, "Oh, right, okay, yeah, that one's mine. I'll pay for that one." And then so you drive in, drive out, totally seamless. Um, 
there are issues uh, to do with how some of the technologies work and uh, etc. But that is the, the the fundamental use case there. Uh, and then the last one is essentially uh, it's 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 similar to what you would do at the moment in the pay on foot car park. But instead of actually having to go to the pay station, you can scan your ticket. So you take a ticket as you go in. You can scan your scan your ticket and pay it uh, pay it online rather than having to wait at the um, uh, go to the pay station and, and wait there and that, that obviously has um, um, implications that are positive both for the for the user and for the operator because the important uh, the, the, the biggest costs in, in pay on foot systems are, are the pay machines um, next please so um, this proof of concept stage we're in at the moment uh, I have to say that we Keith and I were rather nervous that we were not going to get necessarily uh, a great deal of enthusiasm perhaps from the the particularly from the private sector we knew that from the public sector particularly for um, uh, multi-vendor um, um, functionality that that is something that, that there, are, there are many uh, local authorities wanted wanted to, to want to introduce um, and as Tice was saying um, perhaps uh, uh, whether you Perhaps um, he was being, uh, how shall I put it, tactful. Uh, I mean, the UK is definitely behind uh, other other parts of the world where that has been in place for a number of years. OK, so uh, what we're doing here in many ways, uh, there are a lot of aspects of it are not particularly uh, new. It's the way we're doing it um, and, and, and the fact that it will uh, apply both to, to on street and off street. Um, so uh, uh, we were a bit nervous as to how the private sector would react because uh, it will change their business models. Uh, and in fact, we've been very, very pleasantly surprised. So um, the fact that Tice is here today, you know, as the, one of the major um, payment providers uh, in, in the world, uh, is, is, is just one indication because all, all of the folks uh, that are shown on the uh, uh, on the private sector side there of all, um, we're having discussions with all of them about various uh, proof of concept projects and folks on the left are, are obviously in, in, in many cases um, it, it needs a, 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 a some kind of public authority um, uh, to, to, to collaborate with this I mean obviously Manchester are the host for the for the whole project uh, and we are actually doing implementations within Manchester uh, of, of the um, of the national parking uh, platform in January to be able to run their car parks uh, so um, we'll have signs up with Just Eat everywhere. Uh, Danny, is that how we're going to pay for the, the parking, if I understood correctly? Um, but the, the 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 other folks there on the, on the on the left, we're 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 working on projects with all of them um, uh, to 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 implement uh, various aspects of uh, um, uh, of, of, of ABDS. Right. Uh, next, please. So uh, the. A few years ago, when I was doing a, um, uh, a media training thing, which you're probably saying to yourself, "Go on, Nigel, you didn't learn very much." But anyway, um, it was I was worse before my presentations. The the the, the uh, teacher was saying, and the person leading the session was saying, "Well, the one thing you should always ask yourself is, is Wizzy yes? So why should I give a, okay, whatever?" And I thought it was important. I mean, Danny, in a way, has stolen my thunder there because he's explained it all. But I mean, uh, in terms of the end user, at least. But uh, so improved customer experience. We've talked about sort of frictionless parking, multi-vendor uh, and improved journey planning. But I mean, from the point of view of local authorities uh, and, and to an extent, the private sector is 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 being able to, to uh, capture data more, much more uh, readily uh, and, and cheaply and automatically. Um, and and be able to use that data then to to uh, improve efficiency and also to evaluate uh, for local authorities the impact of uh, of policies. So um, the that then um, I'm going to leap across down to bottom right. So policy implementation, what we're talking about, will uh, make it easier to do various things with parking. Uh, to like for instance, introducing dynamic pricing. To to uh, or, or or differential pricing, i.e., for vehicles that got different, you know, fuel supply, uh, fuel types, or whatever, um, and it, it's also possible to do stuff to support local businesses, um, which sort of links in a bit to what Danny was saying. It's maybe uh, you know when you're a, 
uh, if you're if you if you're not having your your um, food delivered or uh, you're actually going to the store to pick things up, then maybe you will get uh, you know maybe the local business will actually um, subsidise your parking by just clicking on thing and that goes through the platform. Or well, that happens much easier than systems today, where generally you end up with sort of vouchers and whatever's and it, it all becomes very complicated. So all of those type of things will be much much easier, and you know hopefully that policy implementation. Uh, will allow uh, to to integrate, um, as 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 Tees was saying, with 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 other aspects of, of of multimodal transport. It will also make it much easier for people to innovate because one of the things at the moment is that because of this lack of uh, interoperability between systems, it's very difficult for small startups uh, to 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 actually uh, enter into the market just because the. Uh, the the um, uh, the sort of hurdle of actually being able to 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 access this data and is 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 very high. And lastly, uh, top right, so national asset. Uh, it's going to be publicly owned, a neutral platform, which is important, so that people uh, operators they put their data on the platform. They're not giving it to a competitor uh, to to. Uh, but it, it is neutral, and it should simplify the procurement process. Um, uh, and for, for, for local authorities. I won't get into that now, but that's one of the things we're looking into at the moment. There is a working group of, uh, in fact, there are two working groups. There's a working group of, of, of public uh, authorities, um, mostly the ones that were in the, in the previous slide on the left, uh, looking into the whole question of the sort of commercial aspects of this and the contractual aspects um, uh, uh, and, and the procurement aspects. So uh, and it will definitely deliver the, the platform will definitely deliver uh, efficiencies and, and, and savings. So uh, the other working group, uh, which is from the, the commercial operators, is is looking at similar aspects. Uh, so commercial, uh, operational, how money flows through uh, uh, to the local authorities, uh, etc. So um, it's not it's the, the, the technical aspects of the platform are relatively simple. The commercial and the the, the governance aspects are, are are somewhat more um, somewhat more complicated, but we're working through. So I think last couple of slides, um, yeah. So I mean, integrated or autom automated future. This in a way was kind of key things up for for um, for John. What's coming up next? Because uh, APDS itself, as Keith showed, is 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 a standard that sits in a landscape of other standards, uh, notably ones that. Uh, um, uh, related to to uh, the use of the highway, um, and um, the 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 whole idea is that um, not only will be interoperability um, uh, of, of 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 different systems. Um, I'm being told I've got to I've got to get off, so apologies, I've gone too long. Right, well, bit, I'll, if you've got any questions on that, we can come back to it later. Just the last slide, then. Um, so uh, now my car parks itself. Uh, and you know the 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 whole question of automated valley parking is one that's been looked into very very uh, um, all of the OEMs are, are concentrating on the moment as being the first uh, the, the first widespread implementation of, uh, of of automated driving if you like so your car park itself anyway thank you I uh, hand back to Graham. Thanks, Nigel. Fascinating as ever, and and a, a brilliant run through. Really exciting. Thank you. Um, I think key messages coming out of that from that night were again about interoperability, uh, integration into automation, and all that relies upon a, a traffic regulation order system which supports that process. I think Keith mentioned very early on the requirement to create a, a digital traffic regulation order. Um, certainly very important for the, it, the work that Danny's doing in Manchester, where the on-street information is provided by information by, from their data TRO database, which provides information on the traffic regulation orders to enable that uh, on street capability. So if, if we want to, if we really want to tie up curbside management, if we really want to have integration system, we need digital traffic regulation orders. And that's something we're working on now uh, through a, a traffic regulation order data alpha. So with no further ado, I will introduce to you the next speaker, um, John Harrod Booth. John uh, will uh, is an independent consultant, well known, I think, to many of you. He chairs the the BESI's National Committee for ITS Standards, and he's been the lead model supporting DFT on the, on the TRO data model development, and of course supporting the APDS organisation 
on the development of, of their data specifications. Before I just let, let John start, I should add that we are running over time slightly, so we will still run the Q&A session, but that's likely to go for an extra 10, 15 minutes. Hopefully most of you will be able to stay with us. Um, I think it's well worth it. We've got some really good questions already come through. But now, John, over to you. Thank you, Graham. Uh, hopefully I can be heard. Um, so next slide, please. Um, I've been given the challenge, which is I've got the post lunch slot and I, I've now, if I follow my own timing, I've got five minutes to do what I was supposed to do in 10 minutes. Um, uh, I'll apologise. I'm a technologist, so I put lots on my slides and then talk over them. Uh, I'm not going to talk on every detail, so I'm really going to deal with this at a, at a quite um, uh, quite a canter. Um, but the important thing, as Graham was was iterating and linking back to, to high level government strategy, is that there's a recognition that preparing oneself for a digital life is is necessary for us as a society, for us as an economy. Uh, and for us as a country and um, I'll link it back to the industrial strategy and the, the future of mobility grand challenge and that all sounds very ethereal and high level um, when you look at that it really starts to talk about how do you liberate data how do you use data um, and standards sits in the back of that and hence there's a, a very strong linkage between what was being discussed on APDS and what I'll cover off which is traffic regulation orders um, the cost of congestion uh, in the UK is estimated to be £37 billion a year, 2017 figures. Um, that's a large amount of money and things that can be done to try to smooth traffic, optimise traffic, better inform drivers are all critical um, for vehicles that are being driven around at the moment, current services. But we also have to think about what's coming and although uh, the Jetsons flying around in, in their own pod is still a little bit fanciful. Automated vehicles are not so far away. They, they really are on the cusp now. And if we in the UK do not get our digital infrastructure in place, then we are not going to claim to be the best place to deploy this in the world. Next slide, please. So DFT have been uh, uh, organising and running through a set of activities that look at traffic regulation orders um, and that really kicked off uh, from a discovery project, uh, the local transport data discovery project in 2018 done by North Island um, and that looked across uh, local transport data in general but it highlighted um, some of the weaknesses that exist around traffic regulation orders. Uh, the existing processes are labour intensive, time consuming, costly. Um, the estimated, uh, um, sorry, there, there are there are no uh, data standards that exist, so it's a very paper centric oriented system at the moment, and there's no central repository, no central reference, so it's incredibly difficult for data suppliers and service providers uh, to access this data in a in a meaningful, coherent way. Um, that then led to uh, a 2019 discovery project uh, led by BPA with Ordnance Survey Geoplace and some others like myself in the background. Um, and that produced three, three major pieces of output, which was a, a big piece of user research, primarily around the processes, the costs, the barriers. Um, a user guide which BPA have published uh, for local authorities on, on best practice in, uh, uh, under the current systems of um, uh, traffic regulation order um, publication and then uh, a draft data model which basically sets the scene for how one would digitize this in the future. Um, we've then moved forward uh, through a succession of projects so there was a policy alpha done by PA Consulting uh, which strongly recommended use of a, uh, consistent data structures uh, looking to publish this data in a more regularized way. Um, DFT have then undertaken a piece of uh, validation work themselves, uh, talking to a, a, a disparate group of different local authorities and talking to some of the leading market solution, solution suppliers uh, to understand whether this data model is a viable candidate to be put as a, as a backbone to a national solution. Um, it doesn't assume, and I'll say this, it doesn't assume that national solution means single, single uh, centralised system, not at all but you, it is underpinned by data standards. 
Um, the current activity, which I'll cover off in, in a couple of later slides, uh, is running at the moment, which is a technical alpha on the data model being undertake by, undertaken by a company called Valtech. And that's really looking at how one would deploy this data model into the national environment, uh, what the system configuration should look like, what are the pros and cons of that, uh, and, and how that should be deployed. Uh, so it's really providing recommendation in back into to DFT. Uh, and then uh, expected, uh, it was originally expected in 2020, but I think it's uh, real, real reasonable to say 2021, is a foreseen policy consultation on how to take this forward. Next slide, please. As a technologist, of course, I'm all interested in the design principles and like the design principles uh, that the data model was built on, um, which is to say, make it as simple and open as possible. Uh, try and link it across where we can to standards that are being used by others, so internationally recognized standards, um, and make it suitable for the future. So try to meet the needs for connected and automated vehicles um, as we foresee them at this point in time. Um, and it's a good challenge. Uh, I was uh, within the activities that we undertook to create this. I was very well supported by some people who know traffic regulation orders much better than I do. Uh, and they came along and said, yeah, that's fine. There's a thousand different variants we can we can uh, identify. And um, to technologists, I like a challenge, but I don't like that much of a challenge. So we've tried to create something which is a 98 percent coverage um, model uh, and that's then comes back into this validation process that's going on at the moment through the technical alpha. Um, just to put this into context, uh, it's very difficult to identify what the needs for automated vehicles are in the future. Um, I can point you at, uh, for example, a Zenzik report published uh, late last year and then republished again in the summer of this year, and it says Automated vehicles require accuracies of about 10 centimetres, and I would challenge anybody who's in, involved in the production of TROs at the moment to claim that any of their orders are at that sort of level of accuracy. So it, there are some real challenges in this overall picture. Next slide, please. I'll briefly touch on the current technical alpha project. So uh, a relatively short term project started mid September, ends, ends mid January. Uh, it's been tendered through the digital marketplace by DFT um, and has a scope to really try to validate the, the model that's being put forward and but more so understand how to deploy that. Uh, what sort of configuration should put, be put in place, how the existing market service providers can feed into that, how that meets the needs of the local authorities and how that will support future services. And obviously using an agile methodology then prepares recommendations to take that solution forward into a beta test. Um, and the last thing which is very governmental is make sure that it passes the GDS test of uh, suitability for a gov government digital service. Um, just by way of an example, if you can move one slide on, Tom. Um, so the model that's being produced at the moment is represented by the yellow line. So, so we produced a model that really works when you have a, a TRO that's at the point of being made, legally, in for, uh, legally created and going to be represented within lines and signs deployed on the street. Uh, it was never designed to cover the whole process. So uh, if you're looking at permanent TROs, there is a consultation design process earlier on in a multi-stage process, and um, it doesn't. The existing model doesn't cover that. And to what degree should it cover it? And so, hence the question marks everywhere, which is where does it make sense to publish data? And that's an interesting question. Um, and there isn't a ready answer to that. Uh, it's part part of the discovery. Um, part of the, the alpha activities to try to better identify that linking into existing studies and talking to stakeholders. Next slide, please. Very dense and I apologize. I'll talk over this. So in terms of what is being investigated in this alpha, lots of different aspects and I won't dwell on any in particular, um, but it has to cover off how one would deploy this what the data quality needs are uh, and how does this align to international standards and that then takes me on to my last slide thank you um, 
and Keith, Nigel and others have mentioned standards and I, I only draw this and I drew this for, for DFT uh, not so long ago, which is to say, um, how, are, how do these standards relate to one another? Uh, there, are, there are acronyms plenty here, I do apologise, but um, DATEX uh, centre bottom is, is the European set of standards for publishing traffic data uh, between authorities, uh, but it's growing over time and uh, they're already working on uh, a part of their overall suite that deals with publishing traffic regulations. Uh, that sounds like TROs to me. Uh, and so um, there is a dialogue going on back and forwards uh, between what we're doing and what they're doing. Uh, when they say they, um, I actually chair the group that's developing that in Europe. So they is, um, is talking to myself to some degree, but of course, there are a lot of influences. The important thing, if I step away from low level granular technical detail is to say, there's an important connection here. Um, uh, the estimate is somewhere between 80 to 90% of all the TROs in the UK relate to curbside restrictions, relate to curbside management and relate in some way to parking or waiting. And so there's a massive overlap between on-street application of APDS and the TRO, TRO space, uh, and therefore making sure that whatever standards evolve, align with one another, talk to one another, share similar concepts, is the sort of thing that people like me spend our lives worrying about. Um, and at that point, I will simply say there will be a further TDI session uh, with more detail on the um, TRO Alpha on the 12th of December, and I will pass back to Graham. Many thanks, John. I, I, I won't spend too much time summarising any of that because I think time is really running, running quite short for most people. So with no further ado, can I pass over to Julian, please, who's been monitoring uh, and assessing the questions we need to respond to from this session. Julian. Thank you, Graham. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, absolute pleasure to be here today and to share all the successes that we've seen over the last two years with the APDS and the TRO data model. Um, I head up the Technology Innovation Research Department at the BPA, um, and a lot of the work that we do is around supporting these initiatives. Let's go straight to the questions, and uh, it does help that we've got some voting on this. Let's pick a, a popular one from um, Bradley Taylor. How does APDS plan to tackle the lack of data and information for on-street parking? Digitising TROs can go some way to help with this static data, but understanding how on-street spaces are utilised is much more difficult to capture and publish in real time. Um, who would like to take that? Perhaps Keith on the APDS might be a good start. Uh, yes, I can. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, the, the short answer to that, unfortunately, is we're not. Um, what uh, Nigel uh, said in the session about the, the, the parking platform, is that the parking platform is essentially about passing information from one entity to another. So I can absolutely see um, Bradley's point there that uh, you know there is a real need to find ways of tackling the, the lack of data. And that is really going to be dealt with by different methods of gathering data through all sorts of different ways from sensors to AMPR vehicles and so on and building algorithms. But that's not really the role of either APDS or the National Parking Platform. National Parking Platform will communicate whatever uh, information systems generate, but it's not really our role. Thank, thank you, Keith. Um, would anyone else like to comment on that before I move to the next one? Um, yeah, am I muted? No. Um, hmm. I, I, I think it does highlight that the local authorities need to, to understand the importance of, uh, of data going forward for parking and for curbside management and many other things. And that when they're procuring various systems uh, and suppliers, they need to, to actually specify that in, 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 their, in their procurements. Uh, and in particular, make sure that standards are, are specified so that they have interoperability. But it is going to be a relatively long process in to, to, to get all of that information uh, together. And it's it's a, it's going to be a, a sort of a um, an accumulation over time, I would suggest. Uh, I think you're muted, Julian.
Oh, do apologise. One from Ivo at the REC. Um, how can this be used to support research? A general question. Anyone like to take that? Uh, Not at once. Press, press. I'll, I'll take that one then. Uh, yeah. um, basically, uh, the data platform will um, store some aggregated data. Obviously, we're not going to start storing storing lots of data that will cause a GDPR problem. Um, and there has been a discussion, uh, in fact, most recently about uh, how the platform really needs to uh, m make some data accessible. Um, in an aggregated form. And I think that's really the short answer, the shortest answer I can give that uh, there will be opportunities for some aggregated data. There is also the possibility of, of publishing some of that to the, the platform users as well in the future. But uh, that's obviously got to be negotiated because there's a, there's a lot of uh, um, issues around uh, who actually uh, is responsible for that data and, and uh, and the commercial and, and GDPR sensitivities of it. Thank you, Keith. Um, there is two parts to that question. Just quickly, how does it fit into the discussion on open data and government transparency? I don't know if Graham wants to uh, make a comment or anyone else on that one. I think it's probably better coming again back from Keith on that one. Uh, you yeah, are, uh, let's stay, Keith. Back to you. Yeah, I'll ask all of them if you like, but uh, I was supposed to be on another call two, two minutes ago. Um, yeah, the uh, <laughs> the. Uh, and the discussion on open data is is a very uh, pertinent question and as far as possible we we will make this data open there is in fact another question about how someone can access the availability data um we can talk offline with that person uh, later if they're uh, interested in actually publishing it um there is obviously different levels of data here because uh, another question was about you know is this is this stealth way of uh, starting to uh, share data on uh, on, on um, contraventions absolutely not is the answer to that um, but we do want to make as much of this data as open as possible um, within the bounds of you know some of it's about payment some of it's about uh, commercial sensitivities and some of it is about uh, um, um, personal data I, I would add Julian that um, this is a proof of concept which we're funding through Manchester and onto the national platform. We are looking from a department perspective about how we make this to a national uh, a national product with all national capabilities. And, and a lot of the answer questions about um, what what is the scope on street off street, how do we get that balance, but also effectively making open data and doing analysis are all questions which we need to ask. I think in a wider sense, so we will be undertaking more research through discovery and alpha to address some of those issues. But for now, the proof of concept is about getting this platform to work and show a demonstration about its, its use cases and, and those capabilities. Thank you, Graham. I appreciate we've gone over time. So perhaps just two quick questions. Ian Job from GAST, uh, has consideration been given to how the data will be collected and updated? Who would like to take that one? I mean, it applies to both models, obviously. Um, I mean, it, it, it does come back to the, this question about uh, who's providing the data. Um, and you know, if, if it's if it's the private sector, um, they're probably more diligent in 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 updating their data. Not always, but they tend to be. Uh, the problem there is you do come back to this question about commercial sensitivities. Uh, so that is, you know, there there are issues there. I mean, it's 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 not a panacea what we're talking about here. It, it's clear. Um, in terms of local authorities, it is going to be a big issue. I mean, John. Uh, kind of put his finger on it when he was talking about the fact that you know uh, autonomous cars will require data accurate to sort of 10 centimeters well you know um and and it, you know if if at the moment if the if there's something has happened to the yellow lines down the street it might cause problems in terms of uh, people getting um um ever when they shouldn't or vice versa uh but you know here we're talking about cars you know potentially uh, getting in, in in trouble because they don't understand where they can park right and they're they're autonomous so the the, the whole question of of, of low, the accuracy uh of, of local authority data uh on street is going to become more and more acute and uh there really is no easy answer it's just going to have to the legit local authorities are just going to have to focus on it more and 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 keep it up to date there is also a technical answer to the question in as much as 
Um, in a general sense, we're using the, the, the latest good practice in, uh, in data sharing and so on. So it, if you're talking about something which is at a major scale, because uh, if you think about a national parking platform and how many transactions are we going through it, uh, to give you a comparison, the Netherlands platform, which has 100 authorities, processes 350 million transactions a year. Um, it's got to be good and uh, it's got to be up to date. Thank you, Keith. OK, a last question, uh, perhaps um, another short one. Is pay in advance a potential use case for parking from Kieran Millard? Uh, yes, but not in the current phase of the project. OK, thank you, Keith. Now, I should say that. Oh, sorry, uh, I, no, I should qualify that. Yes, but not in use case one of the current iteration of the project. To use case two and three, um, well, in use case two, there is some potential for that. Thank you, Keith. There are other questions specifically relating to Manchester and so on, but I, I, sh I would like to assure those listening that we're going to attempt to answer all the questions through whatever means, and I'm sure Tom at uh, TDI will support us with that. So uh, I'll just hand back to Graham for some uh, closing words. Thanks, everybody, and thanks, everybody, all the speakers for a really, really helpful session. Um, Covered a lot of ground there very quickly. Um, I think really interesting challenges for, for all of us in, in how we, we take this to the next stage of development. The government is, is addressing some of these issues. We are as we will take forward more research into the scope and potential of, of a platform. We are working with some local authorities to open their, their parking data. So this gives us an opportunity to, to uh, assess how successful APDS can be, to assess some of the quality and set standards to which we can we can uh, disseminate through other, other mediums. We are currently procuring an open data guidance for local transport authorities to open their data and parking will be a key element of this so we will be looking at how we we write guide right quality right the uh, need assessments into guides to help to assess some of this but it's not an easy solution um lots of really interesting developments and certainly we hope to follow up this session with a tdi next tdi webinar which will be on the 12th of December, which will focus more on the TRO data, mo uh, data model. So we will be very specific to practitioners. Hopefully it will be workshop led. Um, but thank you. Thank you all very much for a, a really successful uh, webinar. Hope everybody got something something out of this. It's, it's a really exciting pro project, which we hope will have national implications. Uh, and the, I think the potential for the department is really enormous. Hopefully that can be translated back to local authorities and to the private sector too. So wrapping up, many thanks to everybody. Many thanks to the TDI for hosting this, this webinar and we'll certainly uh, provide feedback from this seminar and the slide deck shortly. Thank you all.